A fortress is designed to protect itself from invaders. That is exactly our body, except that rather than stone structures or, or spears, it's actually biology. Hey everybody, I am Dr. Josh Axe. Welcome to the Dr. Axe Show. Today on the show I have Dr. William Lee. He's a world-renowned medical doctor, a speaker, and he's the recent author of the book, Eat to Beat Disease, which is a fantastic book. It really gets into the new science behind how your body can actually heal itself. And another amazing thing here about Dr. William Lee is that he has been featured on numerous uh, media outlets, and he's also the off author of over 100 scientific publications, including things published in the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, and he's been served on faculty such as Harvard Medical. Pretty impressive list here to say as uh, the least. But we're gonna talk about a lot of things today, including how your body can heal itself with food and talk about how to beat cancer or starve cancer. So Dr. William Lee, hey, thanks so much for uh, joining me today. Well, thank you, Dr. Axe. It's a pleasure being on and to uh, have a conversation with you. Awesome. Well, hey, let's go ahead and dive right in. Again, I, I, uh, I love you the concept of your new book and really supporting the body and healing itself, which, which is an age-old principle. We know it's talked about in Chinese medicine and Greek medicine and really allowing your body to heal itself. But give us an overview of kind of not just in the book, but in terms of your general health philosophy of how we can regain our health today and beat disease? Yeah, well, look, I'm a medical doctor. I'm a physician, internal medicine, and I'm also a research scientist, what we call a vascular biologist. So I, you know, I've spent years, decades in the lab studying blood vessels. And so I'm kind of the real deal when it comes to, you know, medical science. And when I went to medical school, I was really taught uh, about health, you know, really for maybe a, a few courses. Uh, and then everything else was about disease and what we should do to stamp it out, treat it, cut it, burn it, um, give chemotherapy or antibiotics. And that's really how, you know, I um, entered the world of medical practice is really just um, uh, waiting for the horse to come out of the barn, which is illness, and then throwing the kitchen sink ideally, you know, smartly um, at it, which I still believe in because people do get sick. But I started to realize after, you know, um, many years of practice that, uh, you know, the, the science was advancing so rapidly for treating disease, and yet it didn't seem like it was being applied to actually preventing disease. And, you know, uh, prevention is really the the mirror image of treatment, right? So we know what we should be targeting and getting rid of in a disease. Well, if that target were functionally normal, that would be health. And so that led me to really think through, if you want to prevent disease, um, you can't really use drugs. You got to use something else, which lo logically is food, but you could actually try to study food using the same tools that drug developers use to develop drugs. In other words, you can up the ante to bring a new type of scientific focus and credibility to how we understand the hallmarks of nutrition. And that's really what led me to write Eat to Beat Disease. You know, I came at this from a, you know, really as a hardcore, you know, um, uh, establishment medical doctor doing state-of-the-art research. And I started to realize, wow, what if we could actually, um, uh, uh, you know, um, turn, crank um, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the, these tools to really look at food instead of drugs. And that's really what brought, brings us right to the co conversation that everyone's having today, which is food as medicine. I love it. So good. You know, and this is a term that I, obviously I've used frequently. I know, of course, I'm not the first one that said it. Hippocrates and probably someone way before him has used the term food as medicine very frequently. So talk to me about that. Your dietary philosophy, there's so many out there from uh, vegan to paleo to keto to looking more at Mediterranean blue zones. What is, what is your sort of nutrition philosophy or give us an example of maybe some I ideal foods or food philosophies that you think people should follow to heal? Yeah, well, so um, I, I, it all starts with my own history, my point of view, which is that, you know, I grew up uh, eating really um, traditional Asian cuisines and Mediterranean cuisines, um, whole foods, freshly cooked, not too much, uh, and, you know, designed to be really tasty. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I, I was always very, uh, I always felt that food was something that would, that sustained 
uh, me and sustain my well-being. I always felt that um, deep inside. But, you know, as I got older and, you know, just started to be on my own and, and you know, going to the cafeteria to eat hospital food or whatever it is, or traveling around or going to restaurants, I started to realize that, you know what, we've lo- actually lost touch with what our own history and cultures actually have given us, which is something pretty elemental that speaks to the body. And when it comes to health, you know, there's so many diets out there, as you just pointed out. It could be keto, it could be paleo, it could be Whole30, it could be, you know, keto, uh, it could be some variation of that. It could be Atkins. Every, there's so many diets out there, and most of those diets are pretty strict and pretty exclusionary, meaning you got to remove a whole bunch of things from the diet in order to achieve a goal. And I just felt like, you know, um, there's got to be a better way to do this. And what I discovered that I wrote about in my book, Eat to Beat Disease, is that when it comes to food and health, in fact, it's not just about the food. It's about how our body responds to what we put inside it. And that's the unlock for me um, in Eat to Beat Disease is that you have to understand first before you choose any diet and any food combination, what it is your body, how your body responds to um, keeping our, our health intact. And so what I realized is that you know, there's more than 200 foods. And so my book actually has a huge number of foods. Anybody leafing through it will say, hey, you know what? I actually like this food. Um, but I, I really start to, to um, understand that how are the, the, the health defense systems that are hardwired in our bodies from the time we're born until our very last breath fall into at least five different categories. So our body, think of our body as a fortress, okay? And if you remember, if you think about a medieval castle, you got the moat, you got the tall sloping walls, you've got the little slits in the um, walls where people can th- shoot arrows out, you've got the little um, uh, tiger traps, you know, like little holes with, with uh, spikes in the middle of it, you've got the winding staircases, all these things that a fortress is designed to protect itself from invaders. That is exactly our body, except that rather than stone structures or, or spears, it's actually biology. So five health defense systems are blood cir- our circulation, angiogenesis, how our body grows blood vessels, feeding every um, cell in our body, um, our stem cells that um, are actually in our bone marrow that actually help us heal from the inside out and regenerate our organs as we age or when we're injured. Um, our microbiome, which everybody's talking about, our healthy gut bacteria, you know, almost 40 trillion healthy gut bacteria that, <clears throat> by the way, when we eat something, we're feeding our bacteria. Whatever we're not absorbing, our bacteria is absorbing. And, you know, we're, we're eating, you know, like how the pregnant mom says, well, I'm eating for two, we're eating for 40 trillion. Um, and that's, that's leading to a whole new insight into um, what we eat and how it impacts our um, gut defense. Uh, then our DNA, which is more than our genetic code, it is. But in fact, our DNA is hardwired to protect us against the assaults from the environment. So here's an example. You know, you go out in the sun in the summertime, you go to the beach, you get ultraviolet radiation. That damages your DNA. Fortunately, our defense system protects and rebuilds that DNA. When you're pumping, um, uh, filling your, your tank of your car at a gas pump, uh, uh, do you stand up wind or downwind? If you, if you smell the fumes from the gas, you're, you're downwind and you're the, what you're, the odor you're breathing is damaging your DNA and your lungs. Fortunately, our body, our DNA is hardwired to resist and protect itself against that. And then finally, our immune system is our fifth health defense system that is more powerful than we ever thought because we now know that even an elderly person in their 80s, their, their defense system, their immune system is so powerful can not only help resist infection, it can help resist cancer as well. And so these five health defense systems are at play all the time. And when we sit down to um, eat something, we are either building up and fortifying and boosting these defense systems, or we're taking it down and destroying it. Wow. It's very amazing. I love the analogy of our bodies being like a fortress and sort of how our immune system functions and fights things and protects itself. Um, man, that's absolutely great. So, so as we've talked about this in terms of the diet, can you give us some specifics on what, what are some of these foods? So for, for the everyday person, what would a diet look like for, for, for breakfast? And and I know it's going to vary from person to person, but what are the big things that, Hey, we've got to get out of our diet. And what are some things that you would say, Hey, these are, these are definites that most people should have. Right. Well, so 
you know, everybody who thinks about food and health according to the traditional ways that have been sort of everywhere for the last few decades, you know, it's about what program should I get into and what things should I cut out and what do I need to eat every single day? Well, here's the, here's the you know, um, the newsflash, which is good news, which is that there's no one size fits all. It's all about our individual preference, what our bodies seek, what we enjoy. Um, and, and by the way, the enjoyment's really important because if you enjoy whatever you enjoy, if you can pick something that's healthy that you enjoy, then you're already ahead of the game because what you, you love something that's really health, um, healthy. So what I've done in my book is I wrote about 200 foods and they cover, you know, plant-based foods, seafoods, um, a whole gamut. I mean, even sweets and wine, wines and beers and, and teas and coffees and things like that. Um, it, the great news is that there's a cornucopia of healthy food that science, hard research says is healthy because they activate our health defense systems. But let me give you a few examples. Um, and one of the things that I love to do is to clear up confusion using science. Remember, I told you, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that spent decades in the lab. And so, you know, um, <laughs> I remember uh, this, uh, seeing this uh, lecture once where uh, they showed the picture of, I think, a silver dollar. And, and, uh, and the, the speaker said, uh, showed it and read, in God we trust, you know, uh, which is what's on the coin. And then, and then he, and then he said, all others bring data. So I'm the, I'm the bring data guy. All right. Um, here's, here's a, here's a food that people get confused on. that's actually good for you. Soybeans and soy foods, right? There's this, um, uh, there is a, uh, 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 there is a belief out there that soy is actually dangerous for your health because it can cause breast cancer. And we, we believe this because there's a plant estrogen in soy. That, uh, that, that, that we know is there. And we know that um, some types of human breast cancers can be activated by human estrogen. And so well-intentioned people said, soy estrogens, human estrogens, soy must be bad because um, estrogen can cause breast cancer, human estrogen can cause breast cancer. Well, guess what? If you're a scientist and you look at soy plant estrogen versus human estrogen, they don't look anything alike. And it turns out that the science shows us that Plant estrogens um, uh, actually can counter the effects of human estrogens. So they actually block human estrogens, um, almost like a drug does. And so then the question is, if soy isn't dangerous, what's the proof in the pudding? you got to really show it to me. Well, there's a study of 5,000 women who already have breast cancer, and it was studied that those women with breast cancer who actually ate more soy had better survival. They had about a 30% reduced risk of dying from breast cancer. And those who ate more soy um, were able to decrease the risk of having the cancer come back. Now, how much soy do you need? Well, from that kind of study, it's about 10 grams of soy protein a day, which is about the amount in one cup of soy milk. So these are easily achievable um, uh, quantities. And this is, you know, like if you want, if you had to study food as medicine and you wore kind of like your hat, which was like a drug developer hat or biotech hat, or, or just like a hardcore scientist hat. This is how you would break down a drug, only it comes from nature. And this is an example of one, soybeans. Um, uh, soybeans, soy foods, tofu, um, soy yogurt, soy cheese, there's a whole series of, of diverse uh, soy foods. It's just one example of about 200. Another example would be tomatoes, right? So there's this, um, uh, a lot of people out there saying, well, tomatoes are are, are harmful because they're related to the nightshade plant. Well, you know, history, it's important to understand the history of that. When the first European uh, explorers brought back tomatoes from South America, the Europeans who looked at this, you know, uh, 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 oddly colored fruit with funky leaves tried to match the leaves and it kind of matched the nightshade family. So that's how it got thrown into that basket, nightshade. But in fact, tomatoes have, don't have any of the poisons of nightshade. And in fact, there is a really important natural chemical called lycopene, which is present in a tomato. Now you can have lycopene as a supplement, but it turns out that lycopene in tomato um, uh, has been studied. So there's a study of 35,000 men who, and, and they looked at their in, intake of tomatoes, cooked tomatoes, and they found that those men who ate two to three servings of cooked tomatoes, at each serving being a half a cup of tomatoes, like tomato sauce, that's about the amount you put on some pasta, actually had um, up to a 30% a, a lowered risk of developing prostate cancer. And in those men who did develop prostate cancer, the more 
tomatoes sauce that they ate, the less aggressive their prostate cancer because lycopene um, is anti-androgenic, which means it cuts off the blood supply feeding cancers. It starves cancer um, in this re a really, re really remarkable way. So this is um, the new science of nutrition, Dr. X, which is to really take hardcore scientific approaches to analyze our food, what's in it, how does it affect the body, so take a look, what are we seeing in the lab and what are we seeing in humans, whether it's a clinical trial or a large population study? You know, I love several things you said, and I want to just uh, clarify another thing as well. But I think that, as you mentioned, you know, eating based on our individuality is so critical. You know, my biggest passion in terms of, a, if somebody asked me the diet that I personally follow, I, I follow a uh, TCM or traditional Chinese medicine diet, you know, and it's really based on what I have going on internally. If I have dampness, if I have lack of a chi deficiency. So I very much eat for that. And that's how I've taken care of any patients or people I've cared for over the past, you know, uh, many years. That's, that's really what I've recommended. So I'm, I'm totally in alignment with you to where there are certain foods that other people do best with. On the soy front, I agree with you. You know, I have been a proponent of people, certain people uh, eating uh, especially, you know, especially natto, I think is fantastic in mm -hmm, certain types mm -hmm, of soy, mm -hmm. as you're saying. I do want to say, though, I do think there's an element of with all foods, how highly processed they are in the additives. I think there probably is uh, some type of healthy soy milk, but I think there's a lot of soy milk that's so overly processed that, it, that it's going to, again, just like if we're talking about blueberries and turning that into just uh or any type of fruit like eating an apple versus turning it into an apple juice i think that people do need to be cautious and conscious of that and i think as you talked about i love this point that you made about soy and it actually having things that look like estrogen or mimic estrogen but actually can block unhealthy estrogen in the body and it's a similar thing with flax seeds have that say a similar compound mm -hmm. lavender vitex mm -hmm. clary sage and they can actually balance estrogen so anyways i just wanted to say i love these points these are fantastic and i know that it is such a big top the nightshades thing so thank you for clarifying for everybody that tomatoes are not actually a nightshade and you talked about cancer man i would love to ask you about that next because i saw you did a ted talk which by the way i mean this is incredible this ted talk uh, has more than 11 million views. So everybody should go check this out. It's Dr. William Lee, spelled L-I. Uh, check it out on YouTube. And he did this TED Talk called, Can We Eat to Starve Cancer? Can you talk to us a little bit about that talk you did? Maybe walk us through that, how we can actually eat to starve cancer. Right. Well, you know, uh, earlier I, I mentioned about one of our body's health defense systems called angiogenesis. And angio is really about blood, blood vessels, and genesis is growing, right? So angiogenesis is how our body grows blood vessels. So I, this is an area that I actually um, uh, spent, you know, uh, 30 years really working in with one of the pioneers, the true medical pioneers uh, of, the, of the world, uh, Dr. Judah Folkman, who was at Harvard many years ago. And the idea is that um, our health is critically dependent upon our circulation. That makes complete sense. But when our circulation is either excessive, we've got too many blood vessels, those extra blood vessels, the overage, can feed um, diseases like cancer, can destroy tissues like joints and arthritis, can even bleed uh, or leak fluid like happens in vision loss and blindness for diabetes or an aging macular degeneration. So too many blood vessels can be really bad and not enough blood vessels insufficient angiogenesis, the lack of adequate circulation, not enough blood flow, you know, our body, our tissues don't get enough oxygen and nutrients through our blood vessels. And so they die, right? And so that happens in chronic wounds or when nerves die. And so blood vessels, angiogenesis is critical for health, but really, really deadly for cancer. And so um, I was invited to give a TED talk um, a few years ago um, to really explain this concept that we all form cancers in our body all the time. You and I, everyone listening, um, uh, partly because, you know, we're, we're made of trillions of cells, um, almost 40 trillion human cells, and they're dividing all the time. And when they divide, they can mutate. And all it takes is for one or two mutations to occur. And, and bingo, we've got a tiny little microscopic cancer. And it's like a pimple that occurs in our skin. You know, pimple, most pimples don't turn into like gigantic, 
uh, uh, craters and blemishes. Most of them kind of go away over a while. Just like cancers, they will stay there and they cannot become dangerous. They can't get big. They cannot get bigger than about the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen. That's about two to three millimeters because when they're, when cancers are born like that, they can't, they don't have a blood supply, no angiogenesis. Um, uh, and then your immune system will eventually spot those abnormal cells. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, you know, like somebody um, picking up litter, uh, you know, uh, on the street, you know, with a little sharp pointy stick. Um, your immune system will wing by and say, hey, you know what? That's not normal. Pop a spear through it, take it and throw it onto the trash and no more cancer. That happens every single day in our bodies. Now, what happens, uh, and that's what, those are harmless cancers. Um, uh, when cancers become dangerous is when those tiny little guys that will never cause a problem somehow find a way to hijack our body's circulation. So they release these proteins called androgenic factors, and then it stimulates like a fertilizer blood vessels to start growing towards the cancer. And lab research has shown when a cancer that doesn't have a blood supply suddenly gets one, tiny little cancer that can't grow, suddenly gets a blood supply, uh, that tiny little tumor can grow 16,000 times in only a couple of weeks. That's enough to kill somebody. All right. So angiogenesis is a trigger um, that that when you pull it, it's between goes it converts a harmless cancer into a deadly one. This is this now led to the development of more than 18 medicines that cancer doctors use to cut off the blood supply to cancers. These are called anti-angiogenic drugs. And you know, I explained in, in TED, you know, how successful these have been, how important they have been. But what I wanted to point out is that using the same tools to discover drugs, medicines that can interfere with, um, to cut off a blood supply to tumor, starve a cancer, I've actually been able to test food. And when you actually test wow. food in those systems, you, and you can test them head to head, side by side, you wind up seeing that green tea, soy, lavender, citrus fruits, broccoli, uh, they, they can stand up right next to cancer drugs. And so that was really the, light bulb that led me to realize that we can actually really do this. We can really study foods with the same seriousness that we actually study medicines. And that's what I presented in my TED Talk, and I showed all these different ways that we can actually apply that. And my, my book, actually, which is written you know, almost 10 years later, um, uh, actually uh, is a gigantic update um, on all the things that are, have happened since then. Uh, which is, you know, which is what I think, you know, why it's been received so well is that people are, you know, we've arrived at a time in society where people are genuinely interested in knowing what is the truth, what is the science behind, what is the evidence behind how foods can actually influence our health. And the good news is it's about including foods, not about excluding foods. I absolutely love this. What a uh, what a fantastic topic for for a book and getting out how to beat disease and doing it through as you're talking about all of these medical studies and research and that principle you just talked about. So I want to encourage everybody. Hey, check out uh, Dr. William Lee's book here. It's on Amazon. Uh, it's also at your local bookstores, Barnes and Noble. Make sure to check it out. It's called Eat to Beat Disease. So eat. Eat to Beat Disease. Just go on Amazon and check out Eat to Beat Disease. Dr. William Lee, uh, last name L I. And uh, man, this book looks fantastic. And I love this principle you talked about here with um, how important it is the circulatory system, but also the comparison of it to a a pimple in the skin. Again, a lot of times people don't realize that cancer cells are created in our body every day. Our body is able to typically destroy those, but there's obviously some things. Um, if it can hijack your circulatory system, how it affects that. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, Dr. William Lee, what, what, what would you say, what are some ideal foods and herbs uh, specifically for cancer that you think may support cancer prevention? Okay, well, you know, so again, one of the things that I really believe in is choice. And so in my book, there's more than 200 uh, uh, foods that are all choices. And in fact, one of the things I just wanna mention um, uh, is that for any of your listeners who want to actually um, get a free shopping list of foods that are, is mirrored after how you might encounter them in going to the grocery store, I bet you made that available if you come to my website, which is www.drwilliamleeli.com. I've made that available so that on a daily basis, people can actually just figure out how to navigate the grocery store to choose among the foods that actually can help fight cancer and other diseases. So 
what are some really um, what are what are some um, uh, what are some highlight foods that I think are great cancer fighters? Green tea is definitely one of them, um, uh, and I love whole leaf green tea. Um, and, I, and one of the things that like tips I tell people is if you want to drink you know probably two plus cups of green tea a day. People in China and Asia and many people in America now um, uh, you know drink many more cups than that. I probably drink six cups of green tea a day when I drink tea. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, that actually floods our system with natural bioactive chemicals that come from the tea plant, uh, that can actually cut off the blood supply to tumors, actually even, um, kill cancer stem cells. Um, and it also protects the blood vessels feeding our heart, um, uh, circulating in our, our circulation for our heart as well. So very, very important, um, for, for cancer fighting is green tea. Soy is another one. We've already talked about that. Um, um, another one that's sort of um, uh, uh, important is actually tree nuts, right? So what are tree nuts? They are pistachios, they're almonds, they're cashews, uh, macadamias, they are walnuts. Um, I love walnuts myself. And it turns out that a major study of 700 people um, uh, uh, that was presented at one of the major cancer meetings, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, showed that people who ate you know, uh, a couple of handfuls of walnuts a day. It's about 15 walnuts, uh, sorry, a week. Um, so um, uh, uh, actually had up to a 50% reduction in death if they had stage three colon cancer. And if they had their cancer successfully treated, it also um, markedly decreased the risk of their cancer coming back. And so, you know, a, a couple of handfuls of nuts as a snack uh, is a really uh, great way to reduce your risk um, of cancer. So, um, so how, do, how does, um, how does uh, a, a nut work? Um, well, it turns out that uh, tree nuts also not only have healthy omega-3 fatty acids that can cut off the blood supply feeding cancer cells, anti-angiogenic, nuts are anti-angiogenic, but they also have insoluble fiber. They're a great source of fiber. So when we eat a nut and we swallow it, you know, the oil gets, the good omega-3s get absor absorbed in our bloodstream. But then the fiber, and everybody knows nuts kind of, you know, have this fiber C stuff. We swallow that. Our body doesn't absorb that fiber. It, you know, helps digestion for sure. But what we don't die, what we don't actually absorb in our digestion, which is this insoluble fiber, feeds our microbiome. That the health defense system, and it activates our immune system. The microbiome activates our immune system, and it cuts up the fiber into these little fragments um, uh, called small chain fatty acids. And they lower inflammation, which lowers cancer risk. So we can figure out now the mechanisms why some of these foods actually work. And you know what? A lot of people just don't want to get into the science. Like they're like, oh, you know what? I, I, I didn't really pay attention to biology when I was in high school and I don't want to pay attention to it now. It doesn't really matter. Just all you need to know is that they're like nuts are actually good for you. And it's not eating more is better. It's, you know, just sort of eating reasonably. And there's no single food you need to eat all the time. It's eating diversity, mostly plant-based foods, minimal processing, like ultra-processed foods, as you pointed out earlier, is not good for you. And, and cut down on your meat um, also reduces your risk of cancer as well. I love it. Now, in your book, how much do you look at? So it sounds like for the majority, this is based on uh, a lot of medical research, which is fantastic. Do, do, you, do you talk about anything about sort of uh, historic eating or other nations or anything like that? Like, is there any sort of research looking at, or is, or is most of the research based on what you're saying, these sort of studies based on, uh, which is fantastic, based on uh, human research? Well, look, I, here's how I look at this, you know, as a doctor. I, I, I understand the science, so I want to make sure that there's like something real there and that's something that makes sense. How do these foods work? It's just like a medicine. At the end of the day, though, when the rubber meets, when the, rubber meets the road, it's really just a work in people, right? So that's why I critically look at, and I put what I mostly wrote about in my book are the evidence that these foods actually are associated with health benefits in actual people. But that said, it's not just about individual foods. Dietary patterns matter as well. The Mediterranean diet, um, you mentioned a little bit earlier, is a super healthy diet. You know, um, uh, if you anybody who's been to the Mediterranean uh, uh, knows that. It's largely plant-based. I mean, vegetables are the centerpiece for most Mediterranean foods um, uh, and uh, freshly cooked and cooked in ways that actually reduce the, the processing, the, you know, don't put a lot of stuff in it. 
Um, it's really just fresh food and, uh, and diversity across different food groups. Vegetables tend to be seasonal. You add garlic to it. You add herbs like rosemary and thyme and basil. These herbs are all, uh, all contain sort of mo their mother nature's um, pharmacy because they actually contain these natural bioactives that act, that act on and activate our, the cells in our health defense systems. And, it, you know, over thousands of years, the patterns of eating like the Mediterranean diet and the Asian diet have been tempered by the wisdom of the, you know, of the millennia uh, of sort of what patterns tend to make the most sense, like taste great, seasonal, and also are associated with health. And that's one of the, you know, that, that, that innate historical understanding our culture, our history informs us who we are. You know, I think that after the 1950s with the advent of, you know, highly processed food and the industrialization of our food system, um, all of us in America started to lose um, touch with what we ate. And so it just became packaged and advertised and, you know, whatever, whatever appealed to us, you know, um, was something that people ate. And we're now beginning to wake up, I think, as a nation, as a society, that, you know, we need to go back to basics and kind of, so what people are doing now is rediscovering food patterns, rediscovering fresh foods. It's not a new discovery, it's rediscovery. I love it. That's so good. You know, I love the approach of a combination of common sense, looking at what goes on around the world, but also, again, all of this, all of the, this entire book, all your research is backed by, as we're talking about medical evidence. So again, I want to encourage everybody to check out Dr. William Lee's new book, Eat to Beat Disease, and also check out his TED Talk, Can We Eat to Starve Cancer? But he said his more recent research, uh, or the latest research is all covered in his book, Eat to Beat Disease. Now, Dr. William, I'd love to hear from you. What do you personally eat uh, on a daily basis? Like, what is your breakfast, lunch, snacks, dinner, desserts? Like, what are some of your favorite foods that, uh, that, 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 that you personally consume? Yeah, fair, fair enough question. So, listen, um, I, uh, for, I'll tell you a couple of basic principles first, um, because there's no, like, thing that I eat all the time. Uh, I, I go for diversity. But I will tell you some general principles first. Um, I try to minimize the amount of meat that I eat. I'm not a vegan, and I will eat meat occasionally. Um, uh, but I minimize it. And when I, when I, and when I wake up in the morning, uh, the first thing I do is, um, I will reach for either green tea or I will reach for coffee. Coffee contains caffeic acid, chlorogenic acid, all these natural bioactives that are amazingly healthy for you. They increase your telomeres, which slows down cellular aging. They're anti-androgenic, so they cut off the blood supply feeding cancers and they make our blood uh, vessels actually healthier. Um, and they lower, lower the risk of dementia. So sort of, you know, that's kind of like the wish list of what anybody can actually want. And so um, uh, coffee is good. Oh, by the way, something I did mention earlier about tea, but it also applies to coffee is um, do not go for the decaffeinated versions because decaffeination, most people don't realize they're, you know, the, the manufacturers are often passing tea and coffee through chemical solvents, so you're actually adding chemicals into the tea or coffee, and those solvents not only remove the caffeine, and they don't do it 100%, they do it like 85%, okay? So you're not, it's not caffeine-free, it's low caffeine, but they're also in the same time, in the same fell swoop, removing these healthy bioactives. So you're just kind of getting the taste without the good stuff in it. So, um, so I'll have tea or coffee um, every day. I, I love um, sort of a, a bit of fruit uh, in the morning if I can get it, uh, or granola. And then I tend to eat pretty lightly in the morning myself, uh, and that's enough for me to kind of get me going to my next thing. Uh, you know, lunch to me uh, is varied because I, I have a kind of a crazy schedule, and um, but I will always try to do something plant-based whenever I can get my hands on it. If I don't see anything that I really that really appeals to me or that I think is healthy, Occasionally, I'll skip lunch, and if you skip lunch, you know, a, a few times a week, by the way, you are actually um, doing fasting. You're effectively doing restricting your calories, which we know actually cuts off the blood supply, feeding cancers. Um, it helps your body uh, uh, manage blood sugars better, reboots your immune system, helps your stem cells regenerate um, in your body, uh, and it's sort of like on that kind of ketogenic path. Although it obviously doesn't cause um, ketogenesis, but you know, I don't, I don't mind that. So, you know, I'll try to eat a healthy lunch, but if it, I don't see anything that I feel like eating, 
um, I won't. I, I'm okay skipping lunch a few times a week. And then for dinner, you know, when I actually sit down for a meal or, or I go to a restaurant, by the way, here's a little trick that I use. Um, when I'm looking at choices, I will build my dinner meal, my main meal, um, around a vegetable. I'll look at the vegetable first and then I'll build things around it uh, to make up my meal. And if I happen to be, you know, thinking about anything with meat, um, that becomes the condiment as opposed to the main, you know, and I would just pick at it um, as opposed to doing it. Think about a, think about a, a salad, right? Like a, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think about like a, like a Caesar salad, right? Mostly vegetables, some tomatoes and carrots and, and other good things. And, oh, you know what? There might be a little egg in it. And some people cut up some chicken or whatever it is, you know, um, or tuna or anchovies. And, and like, that's my whole philosophy. Like, like every meal that I prepare, I use that kind of Caesar salad mentality minus the, you know, the heavy dressing, by the way. Um, uh, and, and that's, I think a, that, that's a, that's, that's a navigational tip. I might, you know, tell your listeners to use, think about a Caesar salad, which is mostly vegetables, and then you're adding stuff to it to make it taste good. Man, I love this. It's fantastic. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to put it. I mean, I think for a lot of people, the meat is the center uh, versus where you're saying, hey, let's, let's go vegetable heavies, vegetable first, and uh, have the meat as more of the side dish, which I think is, is great advice for a lot of people, especially as we're talking about beating, uh, beating cancer naturally. It's so good. Well, um, Dr. William, William Lee, I want to say, any, any last words of advice for people? Let's say somebody is saying, okay, I've got a health concern. I've got a health issue uh, w w where do I start? Where are some things I can start doing today? Uh, or if there's one big thing or two big things, what, what, what's something somebody can do starting right now? Yeah, well, I'll give you, I'll give you some kind of like high level things. I mean, number one, if you, if you are actually dealing with a disease, make sure that you're plugged in with a really good doctor with a health system like that. You can't substitute that if you're dealing with illness, yeah. number one, because you can't eat most diseases away. You got to deal with it. Number two, but the health system is really only what you do when you go to the doctor's office or the hospital. Everything else about healthcare happens in your home every day between doctor's office visits. And that's what's missing in our healthcare system. So what I would say is, you know, the second thing that you can do is like take charge. You know, it's kind of like raising kids or having a dog. You know, you got you to take care of it yourself. So that's where you can actually make good food choices. When you make a food choice, it's not about extreme. It's actually about reasonableness. But when, I, when you're making a food choice, what I would say is um, think about how your body defends itself against the disease that you have. And so in my book, I talk about inflammation and autoimmune diseases and cancer and cardiovascular disease and obesity and diabetes and, and dementia. I mean, all the things that we're all, you know, kind of afraid of and struggling with and, you know, are trying to minimize our risks for. It's all in the book, uh, ways, foods that you can actually choose to combat that. So, you know, explore that idea by understanding what you're afraid of and then choose from, you know, this cornucopia, this like long, long list of foods that can be good. But I will tell you some other general rules, you know, look, um, don't stress about your diet. Do not make, you know, because stress actually makes every disease worse. You've got a heart disease, stress about what you eat makes your blood pressure go up, which is worse for your heart. If you've got cancer, stress actually makes a tumor grow faster, by the way, because it suppresses your immune system and it causes blood vessels to actually grow um, to feed the cancer. Um, when you're stressed, you actually change your microbiome, which is trying to lower inflammation in your body. So there's nothing good about being stressed about your diet. And if there's one thing that I actually really want your listeners and my readers to understand is that, look, if you actually are comfortable about thinking about how your body normally defends itself against disease, like how, how it tries to stay healthy, and you feed those, those defenses, you don't have to stress because you, you can choose from a lot of different, you can choose from a lot of different kinds of food. And I think that actually is really the secret um, uh, to lowering your stress is you can choose wisely and start with the things that you already enjoy. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I, I love too that you met you're you're meeting people where they're at with this diet as well. And so you're removing some of the complexity and saying, hey, here's a giant list of 200 things that you can eat that can help your body get in that position where it can heal itself. I want to encourage you guys, check out Dr. William Lee's new book. It's called Eat to Beat Disease. Uh, you can find it at Amazon. Barnes and Noble and local bookstores all across the country. And uh, I want to say, Dr. William Lee, hey, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Well, thank you, Dr. X. I, I'm, uh, it's a pleasure um, uh, speaking with you. I really enjoyed it. 
Awesome. Hey, thanks again. Hey, thanks everybody for listening. Check out the new book, Eat to Beat Disease, and I'll see you next week. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. 